Well, greetings to all of our friends uh, in Zurich and across Switzerland. Uh, I'm Kevin Rudd. I'm president of the Asia Society Global Network. Um, and it's good also to see um, my friend and colleague from Delhi, Roger Mohan, uh, with you in Switzerland for this important update conference. I've been asked to provide the China update. So what I'm going to do in the next 10 minutes or so is quickly run through where China emerges after the 20th Party Congress, uh, which has just concluded in Beijing. On politics, on the economy, on foreign security policy, including uh, the relationship with the United States. Firstly, on politics itself, uh, you will all know from the general press coverage that Xi Jinping's emerged as the paramount leader. But what fascinated many of us in observing closely the Congress outcome was his winner-takes-all approach to the appointment of other members to the Standing Committee of the Politburo and to the Politburo more generally. In the past, a leader's often sought to bring about a form of compromise with personnel choices, that is, to represent the different policy factions, personal factions, uh, or other loyalty groups uh, across the Chinese Communist Party. Um, Xi Jinping didn't do that. Uh, he effectively terminated early the career of three individuals uh, from the liberal economic reform faction of the party, Li Keqiang, Wang Yang, and Hu Chunhua, and instead uh, inserted four uh, new individuals into the Standing Committee of the Politburo uh, who have long-standing personal and career connections with Xi Jinping himself. In other words, he's gone for personal loyalty rather than necessarily an objective selection of talent from across the field, particularly when it comes to managing the economy. One final footnote there is that the previous Politburo had 24 members, 25 members, I should say, one of whom was a woman. On this occasion, there are 24 members of the Politburo and not one of them is a woman. Uh, the Communist Party of China, whatever its other achievements may be, um, has not really overcome traditional Chinese misogyny in terms of the role of women in contemporary Chinese politics and society. Second point I said I'd touch on is the economy. Xi Jinping uh, has been moving the politics of the country more towards the Leninist left, that is, with the party assuming a bigger and bigger role in society uh, and uh, obviously in politics itself, but also uh, the economy. Um, this Marxist move to the left in economic policy mirrors uh, this move to the Leninist, Leninist left in pure politics. So what do I mean by a move to the Marxist left? What you see with a number of ideological statements in the 20th Party Congress report by Xi Jinping uh, is a series of um, pronouncements in support of the role of the state, the role of the party, a diminished role for the private sector, a diminished role for the market. What you also see is a greater emphasis, for example, on new doctrines of national economic self-sufficiency, as opposed to China's more unrestricted and unconstrained full engagement with the global economy. And on top of that, you also see new doctrines about uh, common prosperity, about regulations on private wealth accumulation, all pointing in the direction of a new ideological emphasis on the distribution of wealth. So when I say there has been a move to the Marxist left on the economy, this is not just a grand generalized ideological pronouncement. You see this reflected in the individual instruments of economic policy, whether it's domestic policy on markets, whether it's the approach to the international economy, or critically on the question of income distribution. And for those reasons, I think it represents a significant new set of headwinds against long-term high levels of economic growth in China as the private sector feels disincentivized, the private sector losing business confidence, and the private sector deciding not to reinvest its capital at scale. And that matters in an economy where 61% of GDP comes from the private sector. The third area I said I'd touched on in terms of change at the 20th Party Congress is in foreign security policy and in particular, the relationship with the United States. In the past, what you saw with um, Congresses of the Chinese Communist Party every five years were standard phrases, which pointed to their assumption that there were no major wars on the horizon. 
these phrases were such as peace and development represent the main themes of our time. Phrases such as China at present is experiencing a period of strategic opportunity, meaning that no wars on the horizon, China can focus on the economy. And that's by and large been the rubric under which China has operated for the last 20 or 30 years. The big change this time round is that those standard phrases uh, which have carried with them the assumption that there are no major wars on the horizon, those phrases have now been removed from the Congress report. Instead, there are warnings about the dark and severe external strategic circumstances which China now faces. Phrases which warn the party about being prepared for dangers in peacetime and to prepare for the storm. Specifically, there is language calling on the PLA to be prepared for war and to increase its level of combat and training preparedness uh, for such an eventuality. Put all these factors together, what I conclude from the above is that for the long term, Xi Jinping is beginning to put the country onto a genuine national security footing. It doesn't mean a move against Taiwan tomorrow. In fact, the Congress reports language on Taiwan is relatively moderate. But it does indicate for the longer term, by which I mean over the next five years, beyond the next five years, I should say, in the five to ten year range, that he is advising the party to prepare for the fact that there is a new set of circumstances which it must deal with. And of course, those arise from strategic tensions with the United States over Taiwan. And that's where I suppose I should conclude these remarks, which is the future of Chinese strategy towards the United States. For five years now, we've been in this new period of strategic competition between Beijing and Washington. It's produced a series of new American national security strategies, national defense strategies, as well as a new China strategy released by Secretary of State Blinken in May of this year. And these strategies point to uh, the nature of the competitive relationship with Beijing. They point to the need for the United States to invest in its own domestic capabilities and the need to ally with its friends and partners ac across the world in order to begin to contest the space within which China operates geopolitically in the world at large. As for China, um, it also sees its external environment led by the United States as deteriorating rapidly, as I indicated in some of my earlier remarks. <clears throat> but this brings into stark relief the fact that Xi Jinping and Biden and their meeting at the G20 uh, in uh, Bali. My judgment is that um, both sides have an interest in seeking for the short to medium term to stabilize their relationship, but neither has an interest in producing the sorts of behaviours which run the risk of an accidental conflict between the two uh, for the period ahead. And the reason for that is neither the United States nor China feel fully confident that they would necessarily prevail in such a conflict for the future either. So when we look to Bali, my expectation is there could well be some stabilisation for the short to medium term. But that should not be confused by what I would describe as long-term preparations for confrontation, medium to long term, because the issue of Taiwan simply won't go away. So in summary, this 20th Party Congress is a significant geopolitical, geoeconomic development. Um, it therefore marks a large scale departure from the previous era of Deng Xiaoping of reform and opening and heralds the new era of Xi Jinping. In mm. fact, Xi Jinping has pronounced that his own body of ideological thought, Xi Jinping thought, uh, with Chinese characteristics for the new era should now become the Marxism of the 21st century, guiding China's future trajectory. So we therefore are in new times, requiring new parameters for analysis, rather than simply continuing to apply those we have comfortably developed over the last 30 to 40 years. I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Kevin Rudd. And yes, you got that right. You don't need to applaud, he doesn't hear you. <laughs> So this was Kevin, um, I think, giving a very good overview, and we would like to contextualize this and discuss a little bit with two eminent China experts based out of Europe who have agreed to join us today. And first, I'm inviting up for a response to Kevin's remark, Agatha Kratz, who is a director at Rosium Group based in Paris, where, among many other things, she leads uh, research on EU-China relations. Agatha, your thoughts <coughs> on the state of China? Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> can
I'm going to stand here so that no one sees I've got notes and everyone thinks that I'm uh, saying all of this out of my memory. Uh, it looks better. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thanks for the chance to address uh, Kevin's excellent remark. I mean, most of what I'm going to say today is very much in agreement with his assessment. But here and for the five uh, minutes we've got, I would like to pull a few more economic thread for the discussion here. Um, and I want to um, reflect on what he just said and try and pull out what this means for Chinese economic policymaking in the years ahead, uh, but also for China's economic relationship with the world. So um, if we look at the results of the party congress and if we look at especially the uh, extremely loyalist line up within the Politburo, of course, and especially its standing committee, if we look at how much this signaled the concentration of power around Xi Jinping um, and around Xi Jinping's policies of the last few years, I think the key and main takeaway here for everyone is that the next five years, bar for a major surprise, are very much going to be about policy continuity and policy amplification. And so let me break this down a little bit for all of you here in four main categories. There are four policies in particular, types of policies in particular, that have really dominated uh, Xi Jinping's economic policy making of the past five years. And our strong belief, and uh, my strong belief, is that they're going to continue. The first one, and once again, Kevin hinted to it, is a strong and potentially strengthening role of the state in the economy with further space for state-owned enterprises, further space pays for heavy-handed industrial policy, much more potentially economic um, guidance uh, for where resources are allocated uh, in terms of industries, in terms of geographies, and much less space, in fact, for the private sector um, in, in China's economy, which is the bedrock of China's growth. And so we're going to speak about what the consequences are in a second, but very important takeaway. The second policy, and policy continuation we're expecting to see, is a strong and once again strengthening role of security in the economy. The past five years, not just in China, of course, in the US as well, but in China has seen security concerns kind of permeate the economy more and more with a very security-oriented management of energy, sometimes at the um, expense of climate uh, priorities, a very security-oriented management of data, sometimes at the expense of cross-border data flows that are necessary for innovation, necessary for global growth, a very security-oriented management of technology uh, with a focus on self-sufficiency, supply chain resilience, um, which is sometimes at the expense of foreign businesses and their ability to do business on the ground in China. A very security-oriented uh, approach to food as well and the agri-sector uh, in China. And so that's likely to continue. It could even amplify it in the years ahead, um, which leads me to my third, um, third element of continuity, which is the very strong role of ideology in policymaking. And here, Kevin, of course, spoke about ideology as uh, a driver of uh, policy formation, common prosperity. Here, I want to focus on ideology as a way to manage the economy. We've seen over the past few years campaign-style economic management, meaning that there was a whole-of-government approach, whole-of-party approach, to managing certain elements of the economy of uh, the country, uh, zero COVID policies, certainly the common prosperity policy, certainly the tech crackdown as well. And this type of management is extremely disruptive for business because uh, it leaves aside regulations, legislations, uh, to put the party, to put politics up front and center. Um, so this is, start, it, this is likely to continue. And finally, uh, we're going to see most likely an increasingly assertive Chinese foreign policy with a continuation of wolf warrior tactics, economic and political coercion towards Asian neighbors, but not just, of course, and greater claims to an alternative Chinese model for the world, for the region. Um, so that means two things. Internally, it means that we're very likely heading for an era of lower Chinese growth, uh, because 2022 will be blamed on COVID, but at the end of the day, the smaller space made for private business, for foreign business, and for a market-driven approach to the economy is going to reduce China's economic potential. What this means as well is externally that China is going to face increased, continued pushback by a number of its economic partners, especially in the West, especially from the US, but not just from Europe. We're going to speak about that with Marcus in a second. Um, and what that means is that a lot of the cross-border flows of investment and trade that we could rely on for the past decades uh, are going to be more and more put into question. Uh, so just to finish here and sum us up, 
China is going to become slightly less appealing if its growth slows down. It's going to become slightly more threatening uh, if its uh, party um, congress shows more concentration of power around Xi Jinping. What this means is potentially more global regional instabilities in the years ahead. Um, so I hope Marcus is more optimistic than me. Uh, but thank you very much. Thank you very much, Agatha Kratz. <laughs> And now, as Agatha has already alluded, uh, finally we get a Swiss view from Marcus Hermann, who is the managing director of China Macro Group and one of leading one of the leading China watchers of Switzerland. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, happy to be attributed a Swiss view. Uh, I, let's see what kind of view, what the vantage point actually is. Uh, it's a great pleasure to share thoughts. Thank you, Agatha. It's a pity that Kevin is not here. I would like to actually circle back to what Tony Gucci, Gucci on. You said in the very morning, um, you talked about the document, the 20th Party Congress. If you see my small eyes, I actually just emerged from studying the, the 100 pages that basically came uh, from, the, from the Party Congress. And because I heard now two opinions already, and I will try to basically nimbly add to what I've been has been discussed. I'll, I'll, tr I'll try my best. Um, so maybe the, the first thing, I'll structure it into two parts. The first part is I would like to add some thoughts on things that have been raised uh, previously, uh, and then I would like to uh, add three to four complexities, main complexity that I, that I see. So the first thing I would like to add is uh, what Kevin mentioned about ca wealth accumulation. China has no China has no wealth tax and has no capital gain tax. So I think we need to take it with a grain of salt, with basically when you talk about wealth accumulation policies, this is basically something that uh, OECD countries to a large extent have implemented. Then the term of geoeconomics, uh, I would say, um, Br Bruno mentioned that very early on in his book, um, the BRI seen as a cross-border uh, cross industrial policy. Uh, I think actually with the TTC, uh, TTC Trade Technology Council, uh, from the national security strategy that Raja has been, been pointing towards multiple times, and I really emphasize you should look at the document. I think we see the exact same logic, basically of cross-border aligned industrial policy, technology ecosystems looked from a, from a, from a value perspective, perspective also. Then I think the, the term national security, um, Kevin mentioned it. Uh, I think the national security strategy of the US is now the pinnacle because you see that all components conceptually, they fall into place into, in this document. And the main nar nar narrative uh, threat, uh, the threat that is being used in chapter one is the framing of autocracies versus democracies. I think that's something that we can also discuss in the next session from a Swiss perspective, uh, from, from a genuine Swiss perspective, what does that mean? Then I think the last thing that I would like to, or two more things I would like to comment, um, dropping the term of uh, development and peace as the theme of the time, right? So it's a basically as the, the main theme of the time. This is multi-agency. This is not just the Chinese agency question. So I would like to, that, that, that's something I would like to mention. And then on Taiwan, uh, adding, adding uh, because I already had the pleasure to discuss with Taniguchi-san, uh, basically the, the, the phrase that you refer to um, in uh, removing the DPP. So I checked it again, and I think it really says, if you read it, uh, if you read the original text, it actually says that it's the secessionist factions are um, a barrier, and uh, that's a barrier, and the barrier should be removed. So basically, these are just a couple of thoughts. Uh, I know I come from, from the text, but that's where, that's where basically I think we should also uh, include it into the analysis. Now I would like to move into the complexities. I'm, I'm looking at the time. Basically, the main complexities that I see, the first one is, and I think this is actually the biggest thing, is the fact that she could secure a third term. Because if you have a third term, just put yourself into the shoes of him. You can, in two, basically in two polit uh, party congresses, you can revamp people, right? So basically, that's the, that's the product. You have a fully aligned task force mode that is now ideologically aligned and is set on a path to try to achieve the 2035 uh, objective. On the economic side, I would say, if you look at uh, Ding Xuexiang, He Lifeng, uh, Li Qiang, and uh, Yi Huiman, uh, I think you have all the different paradigms. You have liberal people in it, you have security people in it, you have industrial policy people in it. So he, ha he can draw on the full spectrum, and I think that's also going to be the reality. Second uh, point I would like to mention as a complexity is on security. Uh, security, I got to also mention it, basically, maybe just adding, there's no single new concept in the, in the 19th Party Congress, in the 20th Party Congress that talks about security. All security concepts were there, there. so including cultural security or um, uh, ideological security, as a concept, but basically what's happened is 
the development, the coordination of development and security as a concept has been elevated into the party constitution. And that's a fundamental point, because everything that Agatha mentioned previously about self-sufficiency, internet sovereignty, data protection, it will flow from the fact that you have put it into the party constitution and you can actually, you can actually execute it. Third major point um, that I would like to make is uh, uh, an, a term over, I, I think we need to really uh, appreciate the term, it's high quality development. High quality development also newly elevated into, into the constitution. And that's actually the conceptual backdrop of um, market governance policies. So the fact if you decide to uh, crack down on tutoring uh, industry as an example, but also common prosperity and dual circulation. These are all implementing building blocks under high quality development. So if I take this uh, to, to, the, to, the, uh, to the extreme that we, we say, I think we should all watch is China is now setting out to think about and try to correct what it perceives as failures in our capital systems. So it wants to try to so, uh, solve them. And it's raising the question of what kind of GDP do we want? So I think one natural extension that will flow from this, maybe in a couple of years or maybe at the 21st Party Congress, is I think we need to be prepared that the discourse power, but also the factual rhetoric, will change away from GDP as a nominal uh, measurement, because that's part of how we look at China. But basically, China wants to look at it through the lens of high-quality development. Last two points I would add is that point of cultural confidence and cultural self-reliance. That uh, is, is a concept that has been empowered uh, in the 20th Party Congress. I think that will have uh, a lot of implications on companies, how they communicate, how they behave in China, on their corporate citizenship, uh, on, on all the concepts that they bring to China, because their foreigners will feel more foreign in the eyes of the Chinese, uh, of, of the Chinese Communist Party. And then maybe finally, the last point I would like to mention is uh, party governance. Um, Agata, uh, Kevin, they both pointed to it. I think maybe the two interesting things I would say, it has never been so prominent in a political report to emphasize the party has to work on youth, because we talk about generation Y and Z. What do they think? So the party has seen this point. It basically wants to work on youth. To basically, And what does the party want to do with the youth? It wants to inspire them on the idealism of communism. And I think that's the thing that we are, and that's my conclusion. We are indeed, as Kevin says, in a new era where basically you have an ideology that is believed in and that, is being that, that there's an attempt to execute it with a task force. Thanks a lot.